But first, early on Friday, the United States launched airstrikes on two locations in eastern Syria, both locations said to be linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin offered more details. He said, and I quote, these precision self-defense strikes are a response to a series of ongoing and mostly unsuccessful attacks against U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria by Iranian-backed militia groups that began on October 17. The United States will not tolerate such attacks and will defend itself, its personnel and its interests. Meanwhile, Israel's military said it had carried out more ground operations and airstrikes in Gaza overnight. Israel said it targeted suspected Hamas positions in the Strip to prepare the battlefield for an expected land invasion. Troops and tanks carried out the raid with the backing of jets and drones. Israel's military has been pounding Gaza relentlessly since the Hamas terrorist attacks of October the 7th. Earlier, my colleague Terry Martin spoke with military analyst Frank Ledwidge. He asked him what Israel's overnight raids into the Gaza Strip achieve. I mean, what we're seeing now is quite normal in operations like this. We saw this in Iraq with the Americans and the British. They're called, bearing the purpose, reconnaissance is in force, area reconnaissance. But the purpose is essentially to test the defences, give the troops some experience, try and understand, and, and most importantly, try and understand the kind of resistance that they may face, not only from Hamas, but also from mines and other prepared obstacles near the border. None of them have gone in very deeply. But I think as, as time goes on, we're going to see more of these and some of them may penetrate a little more deeply than the one or two kilometres we've seen so far. Uh, yes, the second thing is that they are uh, messages to the Israeli public. And we saw from Tanya's report there the, the kind of message they're trying to convey. The army is, is in action. It's doing things. Uh, and uh, as I say, we'll see more. Now, reports are also coming in, Frank, of uh, U.S. airstrikes against several targets in Syria. How does that fit into the bigger picture of this conflict? Yes, the uh, Western commanders, from, from what I've, I've, I've been hearing, are extremely worried about this. Now, the raids into Syria by the U.S., the air raids, have been essentially in response to Iranian attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria themselves. So we're seeing a measured and calibrated proportional response from the Americans. We're not seeing any escalation. But uh, th this is messaging to Iran that uh, the Americans won't take these actions against their troops in Iraq or Syria lightly, but also to demonstrate capability and remind the Iranians that there's a very large American force ready to take action should it be required. Those strikes in Syria also raise the specter of the possibility of a wider war. There have been reports, Frank, of an explosion near Israel's southern border with Egypt. Uh, Israel is exchanging daily fire with Hezbollah at its northern border with Lebanon. Could this become a multi-front war? Very much so. I think the, the Taba incident, the one to the, to the south of Gaza, I think analysts in Israel are, are suggesting that, that that, in fact, came from Yemen. The Americans shot down some drones from Yemen uh, last week, and I think this one may have, been, may have fallen short of its target in Israel. Uh, but more widely, yes. And the, the action that will detonate esca wider escalation will be a decision by Hezbollah to, to engage its rocket forces. And I think everybody's keen that doesn't happen. Right now, though, the Israelis and Hezbollah are, are, are maintaining a fairly low level of, of combat. But if we see that intensify, it'll be very serious, not only for Lebanon itself, for which it would be devastating ultimately, but for the wider region. The UN says 45% of all homes in Gaza have been damaged or destroyed. With more than 2 million people largely dependent on foreign aid, the UN says very few supply trucks have been allowed into Gaza since the fighting began. An uncle picks up his nephew's body, shrouded in white, and takes him to the grave. Another young victim of Gaza's worsening humanitarian crisis. This is one of my nephews. My brother's wife and children were all martyred. My nephew was injured two weeks ago, and because all the crossings are closed for medical evacuations, he passed away. 
There's no medicine for efficient treatment, no fuel, but the doctors did their best. The situation in Gaza has turned to one of abject misery, with shortages in everything from water to food and medicine. Gaza's hospitals have been particularly hard hit. Victims of Israeli airstrikes continue to pour in. Israel says it's targeting the terrorist group Hamas. As the number of wounded civilians rises, the UN says nearly a third of hospitals have had to close due to damage or lack of fuel. Fuel, which is needed to pump water and power hospitals, is in such short supply that the UN has warned it may have to halt humanitarian operations if more doesn't arrive soon. But Israel says any fuel they allow in could be seized by Hamas and rejects UN claims that Gaza doesn't have enough. We responded to UNRWA's claim by referring them to where Hamas which governs the Gaza Strip, stores fuel, both diesel fuel and uh, other types of, uh, uh, and benzene and other types of, uh, of fuel. It's all inside the Gaza Strip and there's enough for many days for hospitals and water pumps to run, only the priorities are different. Hamas prefers to have all of the fuel for its war fighting capabilities, leaving civilians without it. And Leaders around the world are debating what can be done to help civilians, who are the ones paying the heaviest price. The World Food Programme is one of the agencies attempting to help civilians, but it's facing challenges. Its executive director explained what these were. We have a large amount of trucks waiting at the gate that are loaded with food. Uh, I know the question has been, uh, well, how will it wind up in the hands of Hamas? Uh, we, you know, we've been in Gaza for years, WFP has, and we have people on the ground. That's all they do is make sure that the food goes to where it's supposed to go. Uh, so I, I can tell you we have the systems in place. We have certainly our people in place. We have other methods to make sure that our cash base transfers indeed go to exactly who they're supposed to go to. Uh, but it's a war zone. Things are going to happen. And so I can't say 100% that nothing's going to wind up in the hands of the bad guys. If you don't want to give funding to people who are starving to death, then do it for national security. This is a national security issue. And so, so we, we can think of it in two ways. Uh, but, but, you know, mass migration is not something Europe wants, nor does Jordan or, any of the neighbor, or Egypt, any of the neighboring countries around there. Uh, and so this, you know, this is, uh, if we can feed them uh, for now right where they're at, that's what we need to be doing. It's a terrible situation. And, and guess, you know, who's, who takes the brunt of this? Again, women and children, as it usually is. And women and children are also among Israeli hostages captured by Hamas. Some members of Hamas visited Moscow, where they met the country's deputy foreign minister, Hamas reportedly said no hostages could be released until a ceasefire was agreed to. The Hamas visit to Russia is indicative of the close ties Russia has to all key players in the Middle East. Whether Moscow uses that to push for peace in the region is still an open question. But here's more on what's at stake for Russia in this conflict. Joe Biden, Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron just some of the foreign leaders to have made the trip to Israel in recent weeks, each choosing to make their show of support, irrespective of past differences with Benjamin Netanyahu. But not Vladimir Putin. The Russian president took over a week to even call Netanyahu, and that's despite more than 20 Russian nationals confirmed killed in the Hamas attack. Instead, Putin has repeatedly blamed US policy for triggering recent events, and criticised Israel for holding Gazans, quote, collectively responsible. But what exactly is the Kremlin trying to achieve with this stance? Putin's relationship with the global south is actually the only relationship in the world that he can now develop. And these are usually very anti-Israeli uh, countries or moderately anti-Israeli, but anyway, those that support the Palestinians. This embrace of the global south comes as Russia's relations with the West are in the deep freeze over Ukraine. And some of this is about business. 
Sweeping Western sanctions against Russia's banks and its exports have left Moscow scrambling to find new buyers for everything from its fuel to fertilizers. Russia also needs help getting around sanctions that block it from buying Western technology for its military. But at home at least, it's also about the optics. Vladimir Putin wants to show ordinary Russians that Western attempts to isolate Russia haven't worked. Domestic propaganda tells the Russians 24-7 that in fact the minority of the world population is against Russia. The majority, like China and India, are pro-Russian. There's one country Russia needs more from than just trade and diplomatic backup, and that's Iran. Iranian-built drones have been crucial to Russia's war on Ukraine. And the country can also share decades' worth of experience in evading the kind of Western sanctions Russia has faced since 2022. Security ties were close even before Russia's war in Ukraine. Russia and Iran have long worked together to keep Syria's Bashar Assad in power. The fact that Iran is the main backer of both Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza, both of them deemed terrorist organizations by the EU, informs what Putin can and can't say in times like these. Iran is extremely important for Putin. I would venture saying that it's probably more important than India, although less important than China, uh, militarily, politically, and economically. Stepping on Iranian twos is not recommended in such circumstances. Condemning Iran, uh, definitely not. The mullahs in Iran uh, also know that Putin's priority does not lie in the Middle East. His priorities lie here in Ukraine. Reduced Western media attention for the war has so far not translated to reduced arms deliveries for Kyiv. But even if the political will to help Ukraine does endure, this new crisis might stretch America's capacity to do so. Analysts initially predicted that Israel would need different weapons to the artillery shells being sent to Ukraine. But now it too says it needs shells, and American producers were already struggling to supply Ukraine on its own. I think that the, this new conflagration in the Middle East uh, benefited Putin because it distracted attention from Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is hope in Moscow that uh, the West will be more amenable to the idea of pressuring Vladimir Zelensky uh, uh, into some kind of talks with Moscow. For now, top US officials are adamant that they will be able to support both Ukraine and Israel at the same time. Even so, Moscow will be happy to see growing competition for American aid and attention. And joining me now for some context is Yuri Rischetto, DW's former Moscow bureau chief. Yuri joins us now from Riga as DW is banned from reporting in Russia. Yuri, do Russian interests in the current war between Israel and Hamas all boil down to one word, Ukraine? Well, I think that for Russia, in any case, uh, it will be a great advantage if the whole world now talks much less about the war in Ukraine and much more about the war in the Middle East. Um, the the, the Hamas-Israel conflict is focusing all the attention, all the attraction on it itself. And this is not only my opinion. Uh, the Russian state-backed media say also uh, this in all clarity. Um, one of the most well-known TV presenter Tigran Kisanyan said, for example, any conflict in the world is now beneficial to Russia, where U.S. interests collide. And that shows that the Kremlin-loyal media are using the Middle East conflict to explain Russia's war in Ukraine. In one sentence, to put it one sentence, the West is to blame, especially the USA, and Israel is a part of the West. But, of course, um, there are other interests as well. In any case, Russia would like to be seen in a different light, in a different spot as an aggressor. In the international context, Russia wants to play an important role in the peace mm -hmm. process, again, as a mediator who traditionally has good connections to both sides of the conflict, to Israel and to the Palestinians. Just based on uh, what you're saying, uh, because Russia does have, as you point out, uh, ties with all the key players, Israel, Iran, Syria, Hamas, Palestinian Authority, does Russia really intend to use this influence to resolve matters or more for its own self-interest? Mm. 
Uh, I think Russia has definitely been using these contacts, and Moscow makes no secret of its close ties, especially to Hamas. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Kremlin doesn't call Hamas a terrorist organization. Uh, these contacts have been intensified recently, and Hamas representatives came to Moscow more and more frequently. I have reported on this myself as a correspondent in Moscow just a few years ago. Uh, and yesterday, a Hamas leader came to Moscow. Uh, the Russian foreign minister said that uh, at a meeting with them, they discussed the release of foreign hostages, of Russian hostages in the Gaza mm. Strip. Uh, the ministry statement called Hamas an Islamic resistance movement and the Hamas leader who traveled to Moscow, Russian scholar, member of the political bureau. But of course, Iran is also a very important ally of Russia, which also, who also plays a major role in this conflict. And Iran's deputy foreign minister also arrived in Moscow yesterday. I'd like to speak about Iran as well, but just to go back uh, to Hamas, uh, we understand Russia is meeting uh, Hamas leaders now, and they are in Moscow, but Russia has been meeting Hamas leaders way back since 2006. What is the interest in meeting with Hamas since then? Well, the Russian's official attitude to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict has changed over the decades, and also to the, to the Hamas. Uh, but since Hamas won the election in 2006 in the Palestinian territories, uh, the Kremlin has constantly improved the relations with Hamas. And yeah, the current conflict is, of course, also a good opportunity to reinforce the Kremlin's anti-American course. Uh, since October 7th, the Russian leadership has not explicitly condemned Hamas' attack, instead emphasizing mm -hmm. the unfulfilled rights of Palestinians. So Putin has clearly blamed the United States for what is happening in the Middle East. He accused them of ignoring the interests of the Palestinians. And this is exactly the same narrative that the Kremlin is using in Ukraine. It says Russia protects the interests of the people there, first and foremost the Russian-speaking population of the Donbas, which is threatened by the, uh, by the NATO or by, by West. This explains the purpose of the so-called special military operation. Now, Russia, as you alluded to, also has close ties to Iran. How concerned should one be about these ties in relation to the current conflict? I think Russia's relations with Iran can be both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it will be a blessing if Russia uses its influence on Iran and calls for restraint in the conflict. And I can imagine that Moscow would like to have the, a de-escalating effect on this war, uh, not at least in order to stand uh, in the international spotlight as a good mediator. But it's also unclear whether Moscow actually has that much influence over Iran. Uh, there is uh, another element to this because Russia has been active in the Middle East in recent years, particularly when it comes to supporting the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. But aside from its military support, the Kremlin has also been using disinformation campaigns to bolster Assad's government. Is there a danger that similar disinformation tactics could be used in the current war between Israel and Hamas? We can't explain it. So it's very clear that this conflict is about the battle of propaganda. And as an example, uh, just a few days after the conflict started, it was a talk about the Western weapons, for example, allegedly used by Hamas. Uh, some claim that the weapons came from Ukraine, uh, to which Western NATO st states supply weapons. Others say, uh, uh, no, these were weapons that came from Russia because the Russians captured these weapons in Ukraine. So. We are experiencing one propaganda battle after another one, and we simply have to be very careful and always check the facts. We'll uh, leave it there for the time being. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Yuri Rusheto joining us from Riga. Thanks so much.